Good afternoon. My name is Lorraine Friedman, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you at Faith Inclusion Network 2021, a community for all, and to present a path forward, helping empower people with disabilities to find their voice through self-advocacy. So my talk is for you, people with disabilities, your families, your care providers, anyone who can help you find your voice and help it be heard, your needs be met, and your gifts and contributions felt by the rest of your faith community. First of all, I want to applaud you because you are our change agents. You are going to help us create a more equitable, loving house of worship. The reality is we need you. We value you and what you bring to us. And we recognize that without you, our congregations are not whole, not complete. So I want to begin with gratitude. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for sharing your stories, experiences, and ideas with us so that we can all grow and learn together. And speaking of sharing stories, I want to welcome you today with an old Jewish tale that explains the power of not looking at and labeling a disability, but rather focusing on the soul within. A poor father brought his young son with him to high holy day services. The son had sat softly making sounds the entire service, but when the last shofar blast was sounded, the young son threw back his head and made a sound to echo what he had just heard. It was so pure, so loud, so strong, that it shocked and embarrassed the father as the whole congregation turned to look at his child, who was now beaming at the music that he had just shared with everyone. The wise rabbi, seeing the look in the father's eye and seeing that in his child's, said, do not reprimand that sweet soul. His song has just elevated our prayers to God. The congregation smiled as they understood that having that one child there made them whole. His differences were not seen as a disability, but as a gift. And that's my wish for all of you, that you're able to go to your faith communities and share your ideas, your thoughts, your needs with them so that your gifts can be felt by all of us. In our talk today, we will focus on finding your voice, how to use it, knowing that what you say is of value and that your needs do matter. These are crucial steps to your personal growth and just as importantly, to the growth and development of your faith community. Helping people with disabilities know that our congregations are not complete without your presence, opinions, and voice are paramount to creating a space where everyone knows they are valued and belong. It's not enough to say our doors are open to all. We need to help create a holy space where all voices are welcome and know they will be heard. So what exactly is self-advocacy? We need to define it before we can start talking about it, right? Well, in its simplest form, self-advocacy is speaking up for yourself and your rights and helping others understand what your needs are so they can help make sure that your needs can be met. There are a few important guidelines to self-advocacy. First and foremost, you must believe in yourself and that your needs and human rights matter because they do. The online resource, The Mighty, home to more than 2 million people with disabilities, poses the same question. Quote, how do we, people who live with disabilities, stop allowing others, 
who do not have a disability for making decisions about us without us. We can't just assume that they get it anymore. We must step up and speak out more. To step up and speak out, we must be willing to talk about why our lives as disabled people matter. When you admit you need the assistance of others, you can help open the doors of opportunity for others to get the same support in the future. So important, and again, one of your gifts that you can share with us. So, once you believe in yourself and that your voice, opinion, and perspective matters, how do you communicate to affect change? Here are a few ideas. Number one, make a plan to help communicate your needs. If you want to write down your thoughts, great. That's one way to go in prepared. Or maybe you don't write and you can ask someone to help you from a parent, friend, caregiver, anyone that can help get your thoughts together and organized to make sure you get them all down. Or even if you don't communicate by speaking, you can have a parent advocate on your behalf. We need you there and we need to know what's going to be important to you. So number one, make a list. Number two, be specific about what you need in order to feel you belong. If you need emotional support and someone to call you a few times a month and just check in, let us know. If you need someone to greet you when you come to services or ask you to sit with them, let us know. Make your list of things that matter to you. In my life, I've been on every side of the disability issue and the times where I'm most effective, whether as an attorney, an advocate, parent, or friend, is when I have a specific ask. And I know exactly what I or my client needs and I ask for that. That exact thing is what I want, so I do that ask. People within faith communities are loving, caring people, but they're not mind readers. And they can't make the changes that you need if they don't know and understand what those changes are. So number two, you're going to have specific asks, specific things you want to see changed. Number three, find the right person. There must be someone at your church, temple, synagogue, or mosque to listen to your concerns. Someone within the congregation that works there and has the power and ability to take those small steps that will improve your congregational experience. Because the truth is, there's no such thing as a small step. Any step toward progress, any step toward making you feel you belong there is an important, valuable step. Okay, so now that we're feeling empowered and believe in ourselves, we know that our voice matters, we have our positive communication skills in mind, let's explore some places within our faith community that might need your advocacy. Number one educational opportunities. Let someone at your congregation know some of your areas of interest. If classes are being offered, are they accessible to you or others with disabilities? And what would that look like? What would you need? Do you need an ASL interpreter? Do you need large print or a smaller setting without too much stimulus? What can your place of worship do to engage you in their educational offerings. Because remember, you will bring a new perspective to others in the class or workshop. We need you there. I can't stress it enough. We need you there. <laughs> Number two, access to programming. Access no longer questions whether you can get through the proverbial doors, but rather it asks you to look at any impediment to you being fully able to participate and engage in the programs being offered. 
if you have attention deficit disorder, a regular Sunday school class with 20 students might be overwhelming and make it impossible for you to focus and learn. If you have a communication device, make sure that you can get a signal wherever the class will be held in your congregation. If it's scheduled to be held in a basement, let someone know because that will, that will necessitate an accommodation. But it's easy to fix if we know about it in advance. There's so many considerations and only you know what will allow you to fully engage and fully participate. Please make sure that someone knows if there's a potential for a problem or a barrier to you being able to be a part of all your congregation offers. Number three, dissemination of information. How is information sent out? Are there options for all kinds of learners and all kinds of disabilities? What if you're visually impaired or blind? What if you need large print or braille Bibles? What if you're deaf or hard of hearing? Are services cap closed captioned or can you get an ASL interpreter for an in-person service? What if you have anxiety or another disability that will not allow you to leave your home? Can you see services and classes online? Can they record them so that you can participate on your own time when you are able? What if you have a child that gets a little too loud sometimes during a service? Is there a quiet space where you can go and still be able to hear the service and learn, but where people won't hear you? Think of exactly what you need to fully engage and participate and write that down on your list. Number four, available resources. Does your faith community have a designated person in charge of disabilities? Some do, most do not. The ones that do are shining examples of progress, like a disability coordinator, a belong navigator, or a director of inclusion experiences initiative. If they don't have this person, ask for one. That's a great starting point, and you're not the only one who's going to need help, but you might be the only one to ask for exactly what you need, because right now you're learning that skill. Number five, meaningful support and real connections. What else do you need to feel you truly belong I know this will be very individualized, but that's okay. If you need something, chances are someone else might in the future, or they might not know how to ask like you're learning today. So be the change you wish to see in your mosque, temple, church, or synagogue. Reach out and tell someone what you need. Only then can they take the steps to make it happen. Okay, we have talked about finding your voice and why it matters. We've walked through some steps to self-advocacy, and we've examined places within your congregation that might need your help and talked about adding those to your list. Maybe just a few simple changes to make you feel more connected. This is the perfect time to talk about those connections. You know, the feelings that matter most and provide the truest sense of belonging. The interesting thing about connections is that they usually happen with simple, ordinary gestures. Dr. Eric Carter, an associate professor at Vanderbilt University School of Special Education and a prominent researcher, teacher, and author in the disability inclusion topic and area, suggests 10 tools that congregations can look at and use to help people with disabilities feel more connected, feel they truly belong. I wanna list these for you because I want you to examine where you think change needs to happen, where you think your congregation can make a difference. Now, this first one is for you. Number one, Dr. Carter found that you need to be present to feel you belong. 
I know this sounds obvious, but it's actually brilliant. He says, quote, belonging always begins with presence. He found that in many faith communities, the primary barrier to belonging is simply the absence of people with disabilities from worship, learning, services, social activities, all the things that make up congregational life. Because it's hard to feel like you're a part of the community if you're not there. So whether it's an architectural barrier or an inaccessible classroom or a feeling like you're not welcome or you don't belong, ask yourself, what is standing in the way of me becoming present in my faith community? And remember, you have to show up to feel you belong. Number two, to be invited. Carter found that for many successful families, quote, belonging didn't begin with a general invitation, but with a personal invitation. He added that when we're not intentional about personally reaching into our communities, we end up inadvertently leaving people out saying you are welcome on a website or signage or outreach materials, that's not enough, Carter's research found. He found that an announcement communicates something very different than an invitation. I want you to ask yourself, have I ever been invited to attend a class, a workshop, or a service? Maybe just some simple old-fashioned outreach is what's needed. If so, mention this when you have your meeting at your congregation. Number three, to be welcomed. It's not always the exact words that are said, but rather how a person feels in a situation. Carter found that when people go unacknowledged or overlooked or ignored, they stop coming eventually. Small acts such as greeting new families, introducing people with disabilities around, or drawing them into a conversation, inviting them to sit next to you at services. These are all simple little things that we can all do, but they're very effective at creating a feeling of belonging. These ordinary actions send a powerful message. So I want you to ask yourself, do people greet me when I come to services? Does my congregation have a warm feeling for everyone? Or are there groups of people gathered and it's difficult for me to fit in sometimes? Have I ever felt invisible, ignored, or overlooked? If any of those feelings happen, figure out when and what made you feel that way so that we within your faith communities can make a difference. We need to know what's going on so we can help affect change. Don't be afraid to ask for what would be meaningful to you. Number four, to be known. There's a difference between being known about and being known. Often, people with disabilities are labeled by their disability, but it's more important to be known by their names, strengths, gifts, and positive qualities. At my congregation, one of our young members with a disability drives into the parking lot with his family and is greeted by the guard. When he walks into the building, the person at the front desk knows his name and welcomes him. All the clergy know and adore him and appreciate his happy, warm smile he shares with everyone he sees. You see, he's known and he feels at home. Because, like the cheer song says, hang on, technology moment. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Everybody now. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see. Our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Okay, that was our seventh inning stretch. 
We needed a little energy to push through to the end of our end of our talk. So thank you for singing with me. I could feel your energy out there and I appreciate it. But even though I joke, it is important to be known. There's nothing more beautiful, Shakespeare said, than hearing your own name. So just think about that, that you need people to know you. Okay, um, I'm going to put some of these uh, different criterion together because just in the need for time, um, we have an umbrella that I'm going to put them under. Although there's research in each of these, I'm grouping these for your self-advocacy meeting to fall under the umbrella of feelings. How does your faith community make you feel? Okay, Dr. Carter has five more here. To be accepted, to be supported, to be cared for, to be befriended, to be loved. Using the positive example of a clergy leader who is unfazed by a noise or someone speaking out while they're offering a sermon helps people with disabilities and their families feel accepted within the congregation. At Temple Emmanuel, Rob, Rabbi Amy Ross is a shining example of this as she joins in the fun with giggles and tambourines with our young congregants. For this special service, she uses a Torah scroll with pictures and her young members gather around in awe and wonder, learning from the Torah their way, in an accessible way that draws them in. Why not embrace joy? Why not embrace laughter? Ask yourself, what would it look like for me to feel accepted, for me to feel joyful? within my congregation, and then share that. The biggest part of advocating for yourself is your ability to be honest about how you feel. Use all these five indicators of what changes you need to see being made to make you feel like you belong. Share your experiences and desires so change can happen from a place of mutual understanding. Okay, the final criterion from Dr. Carter is to be needed. This is so important. Have you ever felt needed within your faith community? Carter says that, quote, rather than just ministering to people with disabilities, it's important to include people with disabilities in ministering to others. One of the programs I always create and I love doing gives people who are usually on the receiving end the opportunity to be the giver. One such example of how important this is, is a group of six women from Autism Treatment Center who pack meals with me for the past couple years for people who otherwise might not have one at Jewish Family Service through one of our outreach programs called Kosher Home Meal Delivery. It's like a Meals on Wheels program. These women, who were usually on the receiving end of the equation, felt so proud of themselves each time they got to do a Takuno Lum project. A project that helps them feel that they are a part of healing our wounded world. This principle is exemplified by the Max Licato quote, not everybody can do everything, but everyone can do something. We all have the desire, even the need, to be the ones doing good in our world, to try to heal our broken, wounded world. It's through these simple actions that all in a congregation will feel welcomed and experience the truest sense of belonging. Okay, we talked at the beginning about proverbial doors. The reality is that doors can serve two purposes. They can open wide, allowing people in, or they can shut to keep people out, or sometimes just seem that way. If there are places in your congregation where the door even seems ajar, tell us about it so we can go kick it open together. <laughs> we know we have to do more than merely open our doors 
We have to open our minds and get creative and innovative. We have to open our hearts and be more loving, compassionate, understanding, caring, kind. It's a long list. And we have to extend our hands and make subtle or not so subtle gestures of friendship, acceptance, and love. Changes so everyone not only feels included, but feels they belong. I want to wrap up by reiterating that your voice not only matters, but also is crucial to the efficacy of your faith community. Why do I say that? Because truthfully, we are not whole, we are not complete without you there. People with disabilities account for one in every five people living in the U.S. today. So how could we possibly be complete when 20% of our congregational family is missing? No, we need you. Let me repeat that. We need you with us. And we need you to partner with us and help us understand things from your perspective. Help us become a better, stronger, more complete faith community. Okay, you didn't think I could make it all the way through a Faith Inclusion Network talk without at least one important biblical quote that explains how important you are to your faith community. There are so many but I decided we should just start at the beginning. Genesis 1.27, the idea that we are all created in the divine image. All. That's every single one of us. It's like a line from a children's song I wrote years ago when my boys were little, trying to teach them this principle. Help me to find you. Every face I see and help me to be the best I can be. Because when we're able to recognize that divine spark that lives within each of us and see the God touch in one another, that's when we become one family. That's when there is no us or them. There's only we. And we all belong. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now let's get to work together.